As a church family, we are uh, studying the life of Elijah, and, and there are some things about the life of Elijah that are comparable to where we are today. I think there's a lot of similarities to where we are today. Elijah's circumstances are a little more uh, ex- extreme, I think, than, than where we find ourselves in American culture. But nonetheless, through, through the life events of Elijah, we can glean some things that are, are practical to our lives and the way that we live in faith in response to the Lord and the world around us. Um, and when we look in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you know anything about Elijah, you're familiar with this character at all, chances are it's, it's 1 Kings chapter 18 that you know about as it relates to Elijah, because this is the showdown on Mount Carmel, right? And for those of you that don't know how to pronounce Carmel, it's Carmel, okay? So Elijah's showdown on, on Mount Carmel against these false gods, pro, false prophets, Ahab the king and Jezebel, uh, the, the scenario that they have created in Israel at this point, we've, we've looked at under King Ahab. We've talked about uh, in, in Israel's day at this time, Israel's already gone through a civil war. They separated two tribes to the south. Out of the 12 tribes, two went to the south, 10 go to the north. And the northern tribes never have a godly king. 19 kings, not one of them godly. And so they go through all of this uh, adversity through these ungodly kings, and God continues to send individuals, prophets, to the north to call Israel back to him. And one of those prophets during the reign of the seventh king, who is Ahab, is Elijah. And Ahab, it tells us in 1 Kings chapter 16, 33, did more to provoke the Lord than any other king before him. He was the most wicked king at this point in Israel's history. And Jezebel, it talks about Jezebel because uh, Jezebel is really the one leading the kingdom at this point. And Jezebel is not a good term to refer to anyone about, right? So if anyone we said, if anyone ever calls you a Jezebel, whatever you're doing, stop and do the exact opposite of that, right? That is not a good term. And, and, and so Jezebel and King Ahab... Uh, they're, they're wicked in, in this time period, and, and God calls Elijah to stand up against that. In the midst of, uh, of leading Israel towards darkness, Elijah comes as a light to pronounce the goodness of who God is. And in chapter 17, verse 1, it tells us Elijah comes before King Ahab, and his name is an identification to what he stands for. Elijah means, uh, the Lord is my God. And so Elijah takes the stand before a king who's got no problem cutting off the heads of God's prophets. In fact, in chapter 18, it talks about Jezebel doing that. And so Elijah takes this stand and God, after he takes this stand before Ahab and says, it's not going to rain in Israel for three years, he tells Elijah to, to go and hide. Because while Elijah has this stand in the Lord, he still needs to mature in his faith. What he proclaims inwardly in his life by, by taking the stand of the Lord, he needs to experience uh, maturity in, in his walk with the Lord. So, so God takes him away into this area that is referred to in chapter 17 as the Kareth Ravine. And, and the Kareth Ravine literally means uh, t- to be cut down. And, and not only does it go to the Kareth Ravine, he goes to Zarephath, which Zarephath, it tells us in, in uh, chapter 17, is in Sidon, which happens to be exactly where Jezebel is from. It's her homeland. And so God takes Elijah to these two different places to, to mature his faith because he knows on the back end of all this that Elijah is going to have to take that stand for which he proclaimed before Ahab. I mean, he's got to become really a warrior in the Lord to see his faith strong. And so God takes him to the Kareth Ravine in Zarephath. Kareth Ravine cut down. Zarephath is the crucible. And God brings him before a widow in Zarephath. And we pointed out in, in understanding relationship, God takes him, you know, in the Kareth Ravine, he, God feeds him through ravens. And now in Zarephath, he's going to feed him through a widow, which is probably the last person in the middle of the drought that you would look for for provision for your own life. It'd be difficult to take care of yourself, but here he is now taking from a widow. Um, but what we identified for us in this is to recognize that God really uses people to mature our, our faith. People have the tendency to bring the, the goodness of God within our lives out of us as we reflect his glory, and they have the tendency to, to help us understand where the darkness in our heart really rests. Like, everyone thinks they're real godly until you get under a roof for seven days a week, 24 hours a day with person beside you, right? And you, you learn real quick, wait, I didn't, I'm not as great as I thought I was. And, and a lot of times what, what you find in, in, in relationship is uh, what we tend to do is we like to blame people for our behavior as if they're responsible, like they force you to act the way they do. And like, nobody's perfect, right? you're still responsible for the way you respond to the imperfections of others. 
No one makes you do what you do. Yes, it may provoke you, but really in that provoking, what it's doing is demonstrating what rests in our own hearts. And a lot of times we don't like that. So what we choose to do is blame others. But what God can do in that is a, is a beautiful thing because what he draws out from us is what rests in our heart because God in those moments can, if we surrender to him, can mature us and grow us. And so Zarephath is this crucible of refinement in our lives to help us understand uh, where we are in our relationship with God. It draws out the darkness. It brings out the light in, in our relationship with God. And, and, and the Kareth Ravine cuts us down. And, and, and if I just summarize chapter 17, I would say it like this. Um, God uses good things to encourage us. And God uses hard things to change us. And that's what chapter 17 is. In, in fact, we're going to see coming out of this in, into chapter 18 that Elijah's faith is strong. But when he, confronts, uh, when he confronts King Ahab again and Jezebel, their hearts have become more hard. When our lives are surrendered to God going into adversity, God uses that to transform us. But when our, our lives aren't really surrendered to him and, and ourselves are God, anything that rips from that, we see that as an attack against us because we're God. And so really what it does is cause the heart to become even more callous in the midst of, of those, those trials, or at least that it can tend to happen that way. But, but what happens at the end of chapter 17, it tells us that Elijah emerges as a man of God. The, the widow that he's with refers to him as a man of God, which is more important. Like it's, it's, it's great if you think you're a godly man, godly woman. I want to encourage you in that. But it's another thing altogether when someone can look at your life and say, and when I see you, I see Jesus. It shows maturity. It shows substance to your faith, doesn't it? And I think that's what God was doing in the life of Elijah. Not just proclaiming that the Lord is your God, but, but his faith demonstrating this substance, this confidence in who his God was. And so now what? You guys, if, if God has taken you in your life through the Kareth Ravine or, or through Zarephath, through the crucible of refinement. Your faith has substance. What do you do with it? That's what the showdown at Mount Carmel is about. Like, if you, you know the story, God shows up, fire comes down, things set on, on fire. I mean, it's, just, it's an incredible story. But I really think it's, it's not just about this event. It's about the heart that's driving this event. And that's what I want us to look at in, in chapter 18. What do, you do, what do you do with the faith that God has given you as he matures you in him? How do you respond with it? I think everyone... Everyone needs a burden for which to care and a, and a passion toward which to give. Like when God does something in you, he does something for a purpose. You think, you know, in, in the story with Elijah, when, as God's matured him and he, and he steps out of the ravine finally, he's finally out of the crucible and he's back out in the spotlight again, like, so what? What difference does that make? Because you remember the, the heart of the problem that we started with in chapter 16 is Israel's walking in darkness and they're following after a king that's pursuing darkness. That's, that's the issue at hand. And so now God has matured Elijah for what? For him to sit on his hands? <laughs> so, so what? And, and I think what we see in response to Elijah in, in the story is, is for us to even examine what, as God works in our own lives and, and transforms us and moves within us, what do we do uh, with our faith? And, and, and here in the story in chapter 18, verse 1, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to skip skip through this pretty quick, um, and I'll give you the, some of the details that happen within the story. I'll just sort of fill in the gaps. I'm not going to read every verse because that would take too much time here this morning, and I've got to watch the Patriots win the Super Bowl today. I'm, just, uh, I'm not kidding about that, but, but, but we have a limited time in our service, so I want to make sure I use it wisely. And so 1 Kings 18 verse 1, now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Like, so here you see Elijah growing in this faith, and his response isn't just to simply, okay, God, you've matured me, and now we're done. But, but to see this faith lived out in his life, a faith of, of substance, a faith of worth and value. Like if your faith doesn't cause you to change, 
Is it worth anything? If your faith doesn't lead you into a a life that looks different than anything before, is is that faith really worth much? Is it even real? (laughs) Is it just a thought of convenience? And here you see in the life of Elijah that his faith has substance so much so that what's being declared here is, is a response in the life of Elijah that could lead to an ultimate sacrifice of giving himself, but nonetheless, it is a sacrifice. Right? Now, I've matured you, uh, Elijah, and to show that your faith has substance, place some worth on it. Let it change how you live your life because it's changed who you are and, and, and the core of your being. And so his, his, his faith begins to, to demonstrate this, this attitude of, of sacrifice because he's going back before the very king that would have uh, taken his head. In fact, if you read the story going on to verse 2 and to uh, and verse 10, it, it starts to tell another story of, of King Ahab talking to Obadiah. And it's not the same Obadiah of an Old Testament book written by Obadiah. It's a different Obadiah. But Obadiah was a godly individual. And, and at one point, Obadiah saw Jezebel killing the prophets of God. And, and he decides he's going to try to help save their lives. And so he takes a hundred of them and he hides 50 of them in one cave, 50 of them in another cave. And he's like, I'm going to feed you. If she finds one cave, at least 50 of them are, of you are alive, but I'm going to do this. And, and so Obadiah is a godly individual, but he's talking to Ahab in this story. And, and Ahab said, look, there's no more, no more grass for the animals anymore. Uh, I'm going to go down South. You go up North and we're going to just look all over the land. And when you find grass, come back and report it. Cause we need to take these animals here. They're going to die. And so Ahab and Obadiah go on this journey, and, and when Obadiah is looking for this land, all of a sudden he sees Elijah. And Elijah comes before Obadiah and says, uh, go tell Ahab I'm coming to meet him. And Obadiah is like, that ain't happening. <laughs> He's like, um, maybe you haven't heard about me. He's like, uh, you know, the king, he, he went through, when you went hiding, he went through all of the lands around us, all of the nations he visited, and he made those nations swear that you weren't living there and to give an oath before he would leave them alone. This is how much this guy wants to kill you. I am not going to be the one that goes to him and says, uh, hey, I, f- I found Elijah, right? Because that's going to put my own life at risk. Do you not know who I am? I'm the guy that saved the hundred prophets, okay? Let, let my legacy be lived there, and I've done one thing for the Lord. Let's not do another, right? Like, watch chance it. That's what he's saying. Like, I'm already at risk here and I'm not going to tell Ahab. And so Elijah's like, yeah, you're going to tell Ahab. And so, and so Obadiah goes and tells Ahab. It tells, says in verse 11, go Obadiah, say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. So when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me, Obadiah says, although I, I your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. And so you see in this story, Elijah, he's taking this risk in his faith because his, ri- his faith has, has substance to it. Like when, when we live a life that makes a difference, the so what, when you think about Israel in this, in this story, Israel's still in the darkness and Elijah's finding his faith growing in the Lord, but he doesn't let it sit there. He wants, to, he wants the kind of faith that makes a difference in the world around him. What Elijah demonstrates in the story is that a faith that makes a difference is a faith that's willing to sacrifice. But before a faith will sacrifice, it needs a burden for which to care and a passion for which to give. What are you burdened for? What do you care about? Does it have substance in the Lord? You know, I think that's why God created his church. I mean, the church doesn't exist just to simply exist. There's a purpose behind the existence of God's church. And we say it, summarize it in two ways. It's the great commission and great commandment to make disciples, to love God, love others. God created his church for a purpose. In the midst of darkness, it is the light. Calling people before the Lord. The need to know Christ. The need for Jesus to set us free. That's the burden we carry. Not only that, it becomes the passion for which we share. The, the, the central to the church is the gospel, and the gospel transforms lives. Jesus sets us free. 
You know, I love the beauty of that within the church because um, in the world around us, uh, people step into the darkness of sin in, in many different ways, right? We all need God's grace. That's what unifies us here. We all need God's grace. None of us, none of us are perfect. We, we all need Jesus to transform our lives, to make us new and to understand just as I need God's grace, so does the person next to me. And that same grace that came into my life, I, I share with others. In fact, Paul said it in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse verse, he tells Timothy, be strong in the grace of the Lord. We all need that. And, and I think what happens in the life of the believer, really cool what happens is as, as we, we start to serve the Lord, we start to care about the things that God cares about, what God cares about is people. And as we care about people, I think God refines that passion. We find ourselves caring about particular people groups within the people of this world. I think we want God's grace for everyone, but, but God gives us passions for certain areas in this world. I and mean, what, what need do you care about? For what passion can you give towards? I mean, God has done something in you. If you've been through the Kareth Ravine, if you've been through the crucible, there is substance to your faith. But if your faith doesn't sacrifice towards those things, is it really worth anything? I think it's when we reject all of the things to demonstrate our, our faith as most valuable. It becomes just a, a beautiful offering before the Lord. And you see within the story that the sacrifice of Elijah, he, he's going before Ahab again. He, he comes before Obadiah, and Obadiah's like, do you understand what this king has done just to track you down? And then in verse 17, it, it, it shows us the, finally this uh, confrontation between Ahab and Elijah. And it says, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? And this word troubler literally means you snake. So if there's any, any need to understand, well, maybe, maybe Elijah had a heart change, in the, or maybe Ahab had a heart change in all of this. No, Elijah's first words to, or Ahab's first words to Elijah is, you're a snake. We hate you then, we hate you now. We have always hated you, right? Elijah's life before the Lord. You see the hardening of Ahab's heart here because what was most important to Ahab is Ahab. And going through this drought, his heart didn't become more sensitive to the things of God and depending on him, but rather more, more hardened because he himself sees himself as God of all things and, and anything taken away from him, it, it destroys anything that he desires because everything's about him. And so his heart in these moments are hardened. And so Elijah, the sensitivity of the Lord matures in him in this midst. Ahab in these moments uh, grows more callous. But Elijah doesn't take that statement like, you're the, you're the snake, you're the blame. And in verse 18, Elijah responds, he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. Because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. Now then send, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets uh, of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah Calls this showdown. Elijah against all of these prophets. You ever think, why Mount Carmel? <laughs> I think Elijah was intentionally picking uh, Mount Carmel because he understood the darkness that Israel was in and he wanted them to, to see in those moments the light and the beauty of who uh, the Lord was. And, and Mount Carmel to the Phoenicians was the dwelling place of Baal. So Elijah literally picks the lion's den. He's saying, fine, if you think you're that great, take all of your prophets and let's go to the most sacred place to this God and I'll meet you there. And so the, the, the stakes continue to raise in what Elijah is dedi dedicating to the Lord and this sacrifice, the giving his life, a faith that makes a difference, guys, is a faith that sacrifices because that faith recognizes the worth of which it possesses. I love the way David Livingston said it. He was um, in thinking about sacrifice before the Lord. David Livingston was a missionary in Africa, and uh, he, he ended up dying in Africa as a, as a missionary. But his, one of his famous quotes is, says this, if a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king ever be considered a sacrifice? 
(laughs) What God's done in you is important. There is substance. And God doesn't just do that to leave it with us, but to demonstrate the goodness of who he is, the grace that's been given to us. A faith that makes a difference is a faith that sacrifices. Let me ask, does your faith sacrifice? Uh, On the back end of that, let me just tell you, it does. It's really just a matter of what you're sacrificing for, what that faith really is. Things that matter to you in life, you give towards. Um, Personal hobbies or passions, you will give time, money, and energy. That's the, that's, that, those are the things, the, the value of things that you have in life to give towards something else to show the appreciation and value for which it holds over you. That's worship. <laughs> But what about the Lord? A faith that makes a difference lives life that way. If Jesus really matters that much, then we should be giving of those things to God. God, my time, my values, my priorities. If you matter, a faith that makes a difference, sacrifices. And and, and then it goes on from here. Uh, Verse 20, the showdown starts here on Mount Carmel. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal, Baal's prophets are 450 men. I love, in the middle of Elijah giving of himself, he really shows what his priority is towards. It's the, definitely the glory of God, but it's to the benefit of people. So Mount Carmel, it is a really cool story to read. I mean, just the things that happens there. It just, <laughs> there's just fireworks going off galore. It's, it's a crazy event. But, but in, this, in the midst of all this, in verse 20, Elijah starts to reveal what's driving this passion and the need for which he cares, the burden that he bears, and the passion for which he has. The basis for this is for his people. Care about you guys. It's not just to say, look how cool God is. It's not to say, I'm better and you're worse. It's not to just prove myself stronger than Ahab. That's not what his pursuit is. His pursuit is for people. His sacrifice is on behalf of others. Look, um, if you ever in life enjoy a blessing, rest assured it came at the sacrifice of the hand of another. Yes, we have freedom, but freedom isn't free. Freedom comes at a cost. I mean, for the grace that we experience in God, it comes in Jesus. For the blessing you have in life, someone else helped you to get where you are. And and in this story, you're seeing Elijah giving his life uh, for others to the glory of God as God has matured him in, in his relationship. And, and so what, what you see is that a faith uh, that makes a difference is not just a faith that sacrifices, but a faith that makes a difference makes pursuing others a priority. And, and so Ahab brings these messenger or these prophets on this mountain and, and then Elijah comes before the people too. And, and look, it just says his heart, come near uh, to all the people. And he said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. He's pursuing the hearts of people. It's as if to say, really, most of Israel is kind of indifferent. It's wherever the leadership wants to take them, that's where they're willing to go, as long as it gets them ahead. Like, whatever, at the end of the day, will just make the king happy so I can get what I want, I'm pursuing that, right? And, and it's not like they're, this deep conviction is, is reflected in this statement. It's sort of like they're just teetering between, okay, there's God, and then there's you know, Jezebel and Ahab. So uh, we'll follow their gods or this guy, whatever, whatever wins the flavor of the day. But Elijah comes to this place and he calls him before the Lord. And, and this has been a mark of, of God's people from the beginning. In fact, in, in the fourth century, the Roman Emperor Julian, sometimes referred to as uh, Julian the Apostate, it, it's, he says this about Christianity in the first century, he says, or the fourth century, the Christian faith has been specially advanced to the loving service rendered to strangers. 
and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal there is not a single Jew who is a beggar, and that they, talking about the Christians, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for help that we should render them. The church in the first few centuries, they were just transformational. Rome coming to know Christ. By the third century, or the beginning of the fourth century, they declare uh, Christianity an official religion in Rome. I mean, Christianity explodes. And you see the heart behind it. It was a love for people, because if we love the Lord, we love what God loves, and what God loves is people. What God is after is the heart. And so God um, uses Elijah in this midst to challenge Ahab on the uh, top of, of, of Mount Carmel. And, and, and so a faith, guys, a faith that makes a difference is a faith that sacrifices. But when we think about that sacrifice, it's, it's not this arbitrary idea of just giving, but it has intentional purpose behind it. It has a, a, a passion for which to care and a, and a need for which to give. And, and, and when you think about Elijah in these moments, he's not just doing this to do this. His concern is for the heart of Israel. Who do you fight for? Where's your spiritual battleground? Do you have a Mount Carmel over a soul? The story goes on, these false prophets continue in this, this escapade of, of trying to provoke Baal. What they want to do in this story is Elijah says, hey, put out a sacrifice and, and call on your gods and see if God will come down and just light that sacrifice so you don't have to do it with your own hand. See if Baal will do this. And so these prophets all come around and they start chanting towards this God and they do it for hours, six hours they're there uh, chanting before their God doing all their religious services. And then in verse 27 it says this, and it came about noon and Elijah mocked him and said, call out with a loud voice for he is a God. Either he is occupied or gone aside. Elijah's literally saying, hey, uh, maybe you just need to yell louder. I think your God might be in the bathroom. That's what that means in Hebrew. And it goes on, or, or it, maybe he's on a journey or maybe he's asleep or needs to be awakened. Just keep doing it. And so it says in verse 28, so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances w- until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no, no one answered, no one paid attention. It's an interesting thought here. When you think about sacrificing to the things that are important to us in, this, in this, these verses, these false prophets literally gave it all. I mean, they, every drop of blood that they could pour out to these false gods, and where are they left? Empty and broken. But God never responds. The same is true for us. Like this, this type of story may seem a little weird to us, a little maybe out of context from where we find people doing things today. I know people in the world still do things like this. But we, we do the same thing, it's just our gods are different. Personal pleasure. We can sacrifice so much to satisfy the, the flesh for just so little. And what happens in the end? We're broken. We're empty. We're left with nothing. And we had given it all for something that matters none. And Elijah in these moments are really, he's trying to draw the heart of Israel to recognize this. That we do have resources. And we honor things with that. And that demonstrates what our gods really are. Where our faith really rests. I mean, it's one thing to call God, God. But it's another thing to really demonstrate that there's substance there, right? And here, Elijah identifies this for people. And, and I know the argument in our culture today. Well, look, I, we believe in freedom of religion. And I want to say, I do too. I, I believe in freedom of I think that's important because, look, no heart should be forced to have to believe. In fact, God doesn't want hearts forced to believe. God wants hearts willing. Right? That's where true transformation happens. Be, it's not about behavior modification. That's what religion does. But God wants heart transformation. That's relationship. God wants it genuine, right? 
And so, man, all in favor of freedom of religion. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that I don't care enough to share what I think the truth is that sets people free. And some people say, look, religion, religion is just, um, or beliefs are just up to the other person. We don't want to talk about that as personal. And I just say, uh, because it's personal, I think it's the most important thing we can talk about. Because it's the identity of who you are. I mean, let me just use just a silly illustration for a minute. But, you know, if I, if I met a fish and the fish could theoretically talk, and I said, fish, look. I believe that you can be free and you can do whatever you want and go wherever you want. Fish, where would you like to be? And the fish is like, you know, I always desire within my heart. You know, I know I'm here in the water, but I, I want to be a land dweller. Can you just you know, place me up on the land? And I give the fish what the fish wants and I throw the fish up on the land. Is that fish free? No. I mean, take another ridiculous scenario and I, let's say a monkey. So say the same thing to the monkey. Where do you want to be, monkey? You're, I'll, I'll take you wherever you would like to go. What would you like? And he's like, you know, the, these trees aren't for me. Uh, how about you? I want, I want to be in the sea. Toss me in the sea. And is that monkey free? No. I wouldn't call that freedom at all. I think it's more anarchy. There is no freedom in that. And the same thing's true with us as human beings. You can call whatever you want free, but if you're not living the way that you were designed to live, is that really freedom? If God created you for an intentional purpose and reason, unless that's connected to him, can you really say you're free? I love the way it's, it says to us in, in Galatians chapter 5, for Christ has set us free. I would argue it's not until you find the reason for which you exist and surrender your life to that that you're really ever truly free. Elijah is pointing this out, and, and I love what it says in, in verse 30. Look, it's, it's Elijah's turn now in, in, in this midst that he's identified for the people, look, the false prophets, they're false god, he's not coming. In fact, he's left them empty. But in verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me, see, you see his heart. Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. I, I, I love this picture. To me, this, this section, that, that thought right there out of this whole story is my favorite part. You think what's happened in Israel. Israel's gone through a civil war and the 12 tribes have been split. But what does Elijah do? Not only is Elijah about to make a sacrifice, but when he builds the altar again, he does it with 12 stones to represent all of God's people. Elijah's heart is for God's people. Not only is it representing all of God's people, in the middle of this civil war that has separated them, it shows them all together. Elijah cares about their heart. Here he is on Mount Carmel, and it can cost his life. And his thought is for the hearts of those around him. Because his faith has substance. Who do you fight for? Can you pick a Mount Carmel over a soul? And the last is this. A faith that makes a difference is a faith that sacrifices. A faith that makes a difference is a faith that pursues the heart of people in that sacrifice. And not only that, I would say, is a faith that also prays for them. Um, in verse 36, look at this. Elijah goes through, I should tell you what leads up to this. Elijah goes through, he builds the altar, he lays down the sacrifice, and he lays the wood underneath of it, and then he orders that people go down and take buckets of water and just saturate the sacrifice. Soak it. Soak, soak the altar, soak around the altar, soak the animal, soak the wood, soak everything, so that when this is on fire, you know that it could not have been done by mere man. And then it says in verse 6, at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Elijah, even in his prayer, the hearts of people. Guys, can I tell you, when we talk about caring with your faith, there's, there's a difference between just caring and, and just ranting. I'm not saying find a passion for what you care about and just spend the rest of your hours 
telling everybody on Facebook. I'm saying do something, right? Let's, I'm glad we have passion, but, but don't just let that emotional energy go and, and things that you say, but the way you live, right? And, and, and Elijah in the story prays, and, and, and I think it's important to pray. And so let me ask the convicting question you always ask when you talk about prayer. How's your prayer life? What if you only get in life what you pray for? Can I tell you why we don't pray by answering why we do pray? I can tell you, everyone in this room, that when you pray, I can tell you why you pray. It's because you have a need, right? And this past week, I had some like kidney stone thing going on. I, I can promise you I was in prayer for the Lord, right? Like there is a need, Jesus, hear me. <laughs> like there is a need, right? And so when we, have, when we have needs, we pray. When we don't, we won't. Because the reason we don't pray is because our faith has no risk. When you lay your life down on the line for Jesus, you pray. When you know it makes an eternity of difference and you reflect on that thought, when you've given sacrificially, you pray. The reason we don't pray is because we don't see the need. It's hard to see the need and the risk of faith when I'm sitting on my couch watching my TV. It's too comfortable. But when you live the kind of life that puts itself out there for for the benefit of others to the glory of God, when there is sacrifice involved, when you're vested in it, I think it increases your prayer life exponentially. But I can say in looking at the life of Elijah, a faith that makes a difference, it's a faith that sacrifices in the pursuit of people and prays on behalf of that people before those gods. Those, those, those types of people that live that way, that, that is the life that sees a transformation in the world around them. You want to see a transformation? Live that way. And here's the result. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. And and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This isn't an easy stand to take. What Elijah did is not easy. I mean, I, I don't know if I could even imagine being the only one before a king that could just take off his head what that would be like. However, as someone starts to come forward, I think it inspires. And as one by one people come forward, it inspires the masses. And when I think about the church, guys, I think evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. When God's people go out and see an impact being made on behalf of the Lord, it inspires God's people to continue to make an impact for the Lord. And so in this midst, what you see in the life of Elijah, like no one wants to say anything when Elijah's doing this at first. Like let Elijah stand by himself. We'll be a little indifferent in this. But then when it becomes crystal clear that it is God, the people stand up and, and rejoice of the Lord. And, and you know, when I read this story, I, I know we can become a uh, uh, little maybe skeptical or, or difficult with it and saying, look, if God would show up and give fire like Elijah, yeah, I'd be doing that all day long. But can I tell you, something greater than fire has come. Greater than fire, flesh. God became flesh for you. Better miracle than Mount Carmel. It's God becoming intimate for your soul. And if God has, in a relationship with him, if he's taking you through the Kareth Ravine, if you've gone through some refinement, because your faith has substance. And the demonstration of that faith is seen in the way that we give to what we care about, how we sacrifice before the Lord or give to him in in pursuit of people, praying on behalf of him that his great name would be made known in their lives. I love the way John Piper said it in his book, Risk is Right, and I'll close with this. He says this, there are a thousand ways to magnify Christ in life and death. None should be scorned, all are important, but none makes the worth of Christ shine more brightly than sacrificial love for other people in the name of Jesus.